Back to the border. Yesterday, we showed you this exclusive video from Allie Bradley at the San Antonio airport showing illegal immigrants, many without ankle monitors, heading for planes and then to anywhere, literally anywhere, USA. This practice has been going on for a while with so-called family units. But the change to releasing single adult males marks an important one. From the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency, we get this. Individuals deemed suitable for release are released in coordination with local partners and are subject to reporting requirements associated with their immigration proceedings. Basically, it says the video is true and we're not going to tell you anything else. There are serious questions about who these people are, what their backgrounds are, what does ICE really know about them, what deems them suitable, something ICE doesn't like to talk about for obvious reasons. Biggest reason, it would encourage more people to come, and more people are coming every day. During a record year for illegal immigration, 178,000 people crossed into the United States illegally. That's the ones we know about. It's a record by over 100,000 people. So 178,000 people were apprehended. That's roughly the population of Santa Rosa, California, or Eugene, Oregon, in just one month. From our time at the border, we know that equally, oftentimes, a num that same number got away. From there, tens of thousands are sent on their way to anywhere they want to go out of that 178,000. These are the cities with the biggest illegal immigration population. But mayors and governors across the country say it's becoming an issue in every state, one that's largely ignored by media organizations. Think about the other cable networks. Fox News covers it basically saying there's a ton of bad people coming into the United States. That's half the story. And we're going to get to the other half a little later in the show because it's an important one, too. Kudos to Fox for some of their amazing coverage on the issue over the past few years. But on Tuesday, Jen Psaki announced from the White House podium a major change in immigration policy. She confirmed from the White House single adults, as we showed you, were released into the United States. The migrants who cannot be expelled under tidy, Title 42 are placed into immigration proceedings, and one of those avenues could be placement in an alternative to detention program in the interior of the United States. Sometimes that means moving migrants to other parts of the United States to move to different detention facilities where they wait for next steps in the immigration process, such as a court hearing, and are required to check in with a local ICE uh, office. If you are confused by that word salad, perhaps that's the point. The press secretary seems to be saying two different things at the same time, that these migrants, even if they're being sent to different parts of the country, are being held by some kind of law enforcement entity. But she also says they're waiting for the next steps in the immigration process and are required to check in with law enforcement. Those are two very different things. Why is this explanation so tortured and confusing? It makes you think they must be hiding something or are just uncomfortable with speaking the truth out loud talking about the video that we showed you. Now ask yourself, did you see that story played anywhere? Was it in your local newspaper? If not, why not? Journalists make lousy media critics, but part of journalism is giving you the whole story, which we strive to do every night. Minutes covering illegal immigration in the past week. Fox News, 60, perhaps even more. MSNBC and CNN, according to the Stanford Cable TV New Analyzer, zero minutes. Pennsylvania State Senator Mario Scavello isn't happy about the illegal immigrants heading to his state. He has a proposal of what to do with them. But we start with News Nation's Robert Sherman on the border tonight. Robert, good evening. Good evening to you as well, Leland. And some activity here down in the Rio Grande Valley from the legislative front. Uh, Texas Governor Greg Abbott holding a roundtable with 11 attorney generals from around the country to talk about the crisis that is here at the border. Leland, we've been down here all week, and the amount of activity here is pretty hard to put into words. Let's show you. Here's some video that we actually just shot just two hours ago. This is a large group of migrants totaling 42, according to Border Patrol, about a dozen children in there as well. That's not the only group that we've seen this week. This has been a pretty constant flow of migrants all throughout the week. Governor Greg Abbott said this earlier today, that if the federal government would be uh, more consistent in applying the federal rule of law, especially on the front of deportations, as you mentioned, he contends this wouldn't be happening. Listen here. There are laws passed by the United States Congress that the president is not enforcing. There are United States constitutional provisions that the president is not upholding. 
Somebody has to hold the president accountable for his abandonment of the rule of law in this country. So you hear a lot of strong words there from the Texas governor. Not a lot of legal might uh, behind this meeting today. Really no authority in order to change how things are happening on the border. That still comes from the federal government. Also worth noting, aside from Texas AG Ken Paxton, none of these attorney generals uh, represent citizens that live on the border. But we do want to bring in uh, Patrick Morrissey, the attorney general from West Virginia, who said that just about every state is feeling the brunt of this crisis, especially them largely due to drugs. From West Virginia's perspective, we really feel the brunt of the immigration problem with fentanyl. Deadly amounts are flooding into our state. And now fentanyl is the leading cause of death in the United States for those age 18 to 45, claiming the lives of over 40,000 people. In our conversations with Texas DPS the other day, Leland, they told us that they seized over 200 million lethal doses of fentanyl last year. That's just Texas state troopers, and that's just what has already made it past a point of entry, like the one that's behind us. That does not include what has been stopped and seized at the border. Leland. Yeah, and these attorney generals say they're suing TikTok over recruiting, the cartels recruiting uh, coyotes and smugglers. Hard to imagine that's really going to even be a Band-Aid on this flow, but uh, they're doing what they can. One of them will be with us tomorrow. Robert Sherman at the border. We'll check in with you later in the week. Thank you. All right. Now, to Pennsylvania State Senator Mario Scavello. Uh, Senator, we appreciate you being with us. As I understand it, you've got a bill that says if there are illegal immigrants who are flown by the administration into Pennsylvania, not the ones that are released and get Southwest tickets, your mm -hmm. bill proposes to divert the migrant flights to Biden's home state of Delaware. Uh, forgive me, but I don't think any bill in the Pennsylvania legislature tells the federal government what to do. No, we also sent, I have a resolution that we're going to be voting on very shortly. And the resolution is, going, is pretty much asking our, uh, congressional uh, folks to enforce the immigration laws that you just heard earlier. You know, we have laws in place, enforce the, in, in the immigration laws. That, that's if they do their job. And it's fentanyl. You know, if, if the president worried more, he's worried about COVID, fentanyl is, going, is, is killing our country. Yeah, but and Senator, that's Senator I, I, we, all, we understand this. We've reported on it. We know this. But mm -hmm. it, it feels like, effectively, this is mostly a protest resolution, for lack of a better term. This doesn't have any teeth on it, does it? No, it doesn't. But, you know, I want them to know that we're telling them to do their job. And, and if they can't do their job, get out. It's an election. <laughs> yeah, a, lot, a, lot of people, a lot of people have been telling folks in Washington to do their I job. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to work on either side a lot of times. I, I want to get this in. It, it's an interesting question. Aside from fentanyl, are you seeing a lot of these illegal immigrants come as far north as Pennsylvania, the ones that have been released down on the border? Does that become yes, a thing? Yes, I have. What's been yes, the effect? Well, you, you know, they, if, see, in Pennsylvania, the school, the school taxes are based off of student population. So if they'll say they put 100 students in my schools, and they're there right now, I have uh, 11 school districts, the, the cost is approximately 20000 a student, and that's borne by the local property owner. Now, and I got the, I have a governor's letter. I think I shared it with you. I don't know if you've seen it. Or yeah, not. no, no. The, the, gov the governor wrote back to you. Um, we, yeah. we did see it. He doesn't seem too impressed yeah. uh, with, with many of your thoughts. No, I, I, I just, yeah. what is he doing? You know, okay. and the, but the point that in his letter, and, and he's, blaming it, he's blaming Trump for the problem. But in, in, in the letter itself, when you have uh, students coming in with issues and they're saying they have issues, that 20,000 per student goes up to about 35,000 per that's student. An, that's, I didn't, hadn't thought about that point. It's an interesting one, yeah. especially when you start multiplying it out by the numbers um, that we've seen. We appreciate you taking the time, Senator. Thank you. Can I, I just I, make one last point, if you don't mind? I got about 10 seconds. I don't mind. I'm an immigrant, okay? I came here legally. And I don't mind helping people, but my gosh, before we bring people in, and you just notice they were all yellow bags in that yeah. on that line. I wonder what was put in there by by us, by the by the 
the feds down there. You know, I'm going to ask you to stick around for a second because I want to read something that we had planned okay. to do after we talk to you, and then I'm going to get your last thoughts, all right? Sure. Stand sure. by Thank one you. second. We have to acknowledge the other side of the story. I wrote this a couple of hours ago. It might not be right, but it is a very real part of the story. When we went down to the border in September, we saw the same pictures of people with yellow bags inside the airport. These are the pictures I took about 5 a.m. at the McAllen Airport, not far from where Robert Sherman just did his report. You can see the signs. We'll take the video full. Please help me. I do not speak English. There were dozens just like this gentleman carrying that same manila envelope with their travel plans. Allie Bradley's video had the same thing. Those envelopes also have their entire life's dreams, mostly families, many with young kids. Obviously, that's changed now. They were going to New York, the Carolinas, Virginia, California, Vegas, and everywhere in between, hoping to start a new life in America, following the footsteps of our ancestors who came to America in search of a better life. Charities or families already here paid for their plane tickets. We know scenes like those at the gate of United 1787 that I was on is an hourly occurrence in McAllen, every day, every hour. Got me thinking about 1909. Frank Mack, my great-grandfather from a shtetl in Ukraine, had a similar sign around his neck at Ellis Island. There he is on the right, obviously. He was asking directions to Edwardsville, America. States, evidently, weren't a concept that he understood. He would end up settling near St. Louis to begin his American dream. I am, of course, grateful for whomever helped him along the way. Coming here illegally isn't the right thing to do, full stop. And of course, in these groups, there are some really bad people. We've reported on them who should not be in this country. But the vast majority of the people we see in all these videos spent their life savings, left behind their homes, and risked their lives for a chance at the American dream. I couldn't help seeing the faces at the airport that morning or the faces in Allie Bradley's video and realize that the rest of the world still sees us as the shining city on the hill. Bring back uh, Senator Mario Scavello, who noted he was an immigrant himself. Your thoughts? Came here legally, you know, and um, I know what it is not to have, and I know the trouble that I had when I first came here, especially in school, not knowing the language. And back then, there was no English as a second language, nobody else to help you, you know. So, but I have to tell you, I, I don't mind helping people, but before we do that, why not help the people on our streets? We have so many veterans on our street. We have so many homeless people on our streets. In Washington, D.C., they're all over the place. Yeah, Doesn't well, you're, you're, you see that? Yeah. So well, what he does, you know, here's what we're doing. I'm, I tell you the truth. I recommend our vets and our, and our homeless population go back over the, go back into Mexico and come back illegally. We'll be able to help them. Wow. Because that's. That's, that, that, that's a stunning, it's a stunning juxtaposition, and one you, yeah. you point out uh, very well. Senator, we appreciate it, and uh, we're glad you're here. Thank you. Thank you for having yeah. me on. So many ways. Simple-minded appeasement or wishful thinking about our adversaries is folly. To ignore the facts of history and the aggressive impulses of an evil empire, to simply call the arms race a giant misunderstanding. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. One of the great speeches in history by the Gipper. Republicans taking on the Russians is like apple pie and ice cream. It just goes better together. But no longer. An increasing number of Republicans are saying niet to confronting an ever belligerent Vladimir Putin. One GOP operative calling it, quote, full Tucker. My friend Mike Allen at Axios reports Tucker Carlson fueled Republicans are dropping a tough on Russia stance, particularly GOP hopefuls concerned about getting on the wrong side of the base. I really hope that Republican primary voters are ruthless about this, Carlson told Axios, and vote out any Republican who believes Ukraine borders are more important than our borders. That's Blake Masters. He's a Republican running for the Senate in Arizona. House Republicans, in the words of Axios, are generally warier than U.S. senators about pushing President Biden to respond militarily to Putin. Joining us now, Congressman Michael Waltz, Republican from Florida, former Green Beret himself. Uh, Congressman, you disappointed in some Republicans who are going soft on the Ruskies? Well, Leland, you know, I don't think we're actually that far apart. I certainly think our border uh, is more important than the Ukrainian border. And I certainly uh, uh, am worried uh, and dismayed uh, along the lines of the senator in your previous segment uh, about so many veterans, homeless and others that won't get services because we have a wide open border. Uh, and I think Tucker's other point was that we ought to be focused on China and we need a true pivot to Asia. 
I think my point is that we can do both. Uh, no one is talking about that I know of uh, boots on the ground, American boots on the ground, shooting at Russians in Ukraine. What we're talking about is doing more to help Ukraine defend itself and to, to deter Russia on the front end rather than Biden's strategy of promising a tough response mm. after Ukraine's already been invaded. And I think they raise a valid point of why should Americans care? Well, listen, Putin is trying to recreate the Soviet Union. He knows he can do it on Obama and Biden's watch, uh, and he thinks he can get away with it. And a recreated Soviet Union alongside an increasingly aggressive China is something that every American should be worried about. Yeah. And Leland, Every Republican that I, not, I, you know, look, not every Republican, you have your isolationists, Senator Rand Paul uh, being being a leader of one mm -hmm. of them. Uh, but look, I mean, the vast majority of Republicans uh, are frustrated with the Biden administration for not taking a tougher stand. Uh, why do you think that so many people, uh, Tucker included, are setting up this false dichotomy that, oh, everyone wants to go to war with Russia versus, hey, when America is stronger, as, say, Ronald Reagan was, who never went to war yeah. with Russia, why the false dichotomy and the, the false choice? Yeah, and, and this notion that we're going to have a D-Day-style invasion with 100,000 American troops uh, in in Kyiv or on the yeah, Ukrainian why border. Do you think they're setting up, nothing, why are they setting right? up this straw man? You know, I, th I think, frankly, it's, it's an easy talking point. Uh, they did the same thing with Afghanistan. You know, it's easy to say, bring the troops home. We should be spending the money here. But what I don't hear uh, him or Rand Paul or others say is, what do we do about terrorism after that? Yeah, Al Qaeda in Ukraine, uh, Al Qaeda and, uh, and ISIS fully intend to hit us again. I never hear a plan after the bring the troops home. Hmm. Of course, we all want to bring the troops yeah, home. For sure. I also want to end global poverty. But I actually want to see a plan uh, to, for, for what to do afterwards. And uh, I don't want to wait until the homelands hit again. I want to fight it forward. I also, in Ukraine, don't want to wait for uh, Putin to not stop with Ukraine and then roll on to our NATO allies that we're treaty obligated to defend. We should be deterring them up front. Sanctions should be in place now. Lethal aid should be flowing now. And it is, as you said, uh, showed with Reagan, peace through strength now mm. is what prevents wars later on. Uh, and Neville Chamberlain, you know, historically is the worst of all, uh, who kept appeasing, not wanting to get engaged, not wanting to get involved. And we all saw what happened after that. Yeah, well, I was going to ask you what happens if we don't confront Putin and you just answered it. Uh, but we haven't seen you on the show in about a month. You've been busy. <laughs> We, we, we checked your Twitter account. I think we figured out why. Do we have the picture? Hey, Army, there okay. she is. Yeah, well, it's actually a little boy. Oh. Uh, the, blue, the blue means boy, Leland. Oh. But, um, but, I've uh, had three look, friends who've had daughters. Okay. Yeah, it's all good. He hit the drop zone heavy at nine and a half pounds. Uh, we're thrilled. Uh, and somehow I got away with calling him Army. So Go Army has a new meaning in the Waltz household. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's great. Uh, congratulations uh, to you and the missus, and uh, really so happy for you. And uh, he's got a father who uh, has done a lot for this country. Uh, he'll be a proud young man when he figures it all out. Well, we have an 18, we have an 18 year old uh, daughter that's heading off to college, and we're just, we're we're refilling the nest. There you go. All right. Good to see. Good to see you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. All yeah. right. All right, there's a political scientist out there who is predicting the U.S. could collapse in years. He defends that position that had, it was in a major newspaper when we get back. Hey, do you have an ID? Okay, I'm going to ask you to put the camera down, or we're going to have to take it from you and place you in custody. Hmm. It's not uncommon for police to get into encounters like the one we just saw in the era of smartphones. Now an Arizona state lawmaker wants to limit folks from getting up close and recording police officers doing their jobs. He's introduced a bill that would ban the recording of officers unless you're 15 feet away. The exceptions are getting the officer's permission, being inside a building on private property, and the bill would be amended to allow the person being arrested to record. He says it's about protecting officers' safety. Obviously, there's some First Amendment issues. The bill's sponsor with us now, Arizona State Representative John Cavanaugh, Republican of the Phoenix area. So big picture here. Do you have a problem with people recording police or only how close they are? 
Only how close they are. Uh, I recognize a constitutional right to record the police in a public place or a private place if you have a legal right to be there. But there are safety concerns for the police officer and for the person recording. Uh, I was a cop for 20 years, and I know that if you are taking police action, arresting somebody, you're focused on the person you're arresting. If somebody suddenly starts to walk up to you, especially from behind, you don't know if it's an ordinary citizen filming you or an accomplice or friend of the person you're arresting is going to assault you. But and the, even if the person is don't not we, don't we though Don't we, though, already have interfering with a police officer as a, as a crime, resisting arrests a crime? What's with the, sec the new bill? Well, the problem is, is that if you're not blocking the cop, touching the cop, trying to get in the way of the cop, you're not interfering. Standing nearby is not interfering. So we need to, and that would of course be a crime you'd be arrested for. But even if the person's not a threat to the cop, it's the person when they get close is a distraction. The officer can turn around to see what's going on. The person is so close, a foot away from them. When that happens, the person who's arrested could assault him, could escape, or could or could try and so you, destroy evidence. So, you, so all I'm saying is you have a right to film, but stay back a reasonable distance. With today's how, how, cell how'd you, phone, how'd you, you can pick take up, a good picture from 15 feet. Yeah, and you're right. The, the First Amendment issues here are real, right? First Circuit, of, Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, case in Boston, you, people have a right to record ACLU versus Alvarez, 2012, struck down in Illinois law, the prohibited recording of officers uh, in their official duties. So, you, so do body cams play into this at all? Your, your four body cams are against them. Oh, I, I have no problem with body cams. In fact, body cams are an argument that uh, you can put reasonable restrictions on a private citizen. With all the police in Arizona having body cameras, you, you'll probably have more video footage than, than you could even use. How, how, did you but, come up, how did you come up with 15 feet? And I'm thinking about the recent videos that we say, of, say of George Floyd, for example. Uh, 15 feet it, without a zoom is, is a long way away to really see exactly what's happening. And at times that's really important, right? Well, I actually studied the George Floyd videos and most of the close-up videos had Axion on it, which meant they were the police body cam videos. Right. Uh, the one video that was taken uh, from, the, from the curb, it looks like the person was 10, 12 feet away, or maybe further with the zoom on. So I don't really think it's an issue. You know, one of the court decisions made it clear that there's a constitutional right to videotape police in public places subject to reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions. And I currently have a couple of our, our lawyers at the legislature studying these cases to find out maybe 10 feet is better. Uh, I'm perfectly willing to amend and alter the law, but to have somebody behind a cop two feet away when he's trying to arrest somebody is just dangerous for the person filming for the, and for the cop. It's crazy. Welcome back. A leading Canadian political scientist believes the United States could be under the control of a right-wing dictatorship as soon as 2030, just eight years from now. No, we're not kidding. What's even wilder is that he thinks Canada should respond right now. He writes, the American polity is cracked and might collapse. Canada must prepare. The U.S. is becoming increasingly ungovernable, and some experts believe it could descend into civil war. What should Canada do? This op-ed was featured in the Globe and Mail, Canada's most popular newspaper. It has a reach of about 2 million weekly readers. Dr. Thomas Homer Dixon studied violent conflict for decades, holds a PhD from MIT International Relations, and joins us now. Uh, all right, Professor. Really, we're going to we're going to have a right wing dictatorship in eight years. Uh, not necessarily. I, I was <laughs> raising the possibility. We need to we need to, in a sense pull back the curtains, especially in Canada, on these uh, on these uh, possibilities of uh, a democratic crisis in the United States. There's a very broad conversation now. Uh, among American commentators, including some very senior political scientists about the possibility of widespread violence should, for instance, the 2024 election be contested. I think uh, most Canadians are not uh, strong supporters of uh, the former President Donald Trump and would uh, look with some trepidation upon his return to office in 2024, right, should he decide to run. I, I, understand, I, I guess you know, people can be had trepidation or not, but he was elected as the president. He served for four years. The transfer of power worked. Obviously, January 6th was terrible, but isn't January 6th 
really proof that the American democracy and the way the framers put this together work? Shouldn't that make people even more confident in American democracy rather than less? I suppose you can look at it as a glass half full or half empty. I tend to suggest that, that think that uh, the, the events surrounding January 6th, uh, the attempts to uh, overturn the results of the election between November and January 6th, I mean, it's now clear, I think, from the select committee's analysis and examination in Congress, in the House of Representatives, that there was a very concerted effort uh, on the part of the Trump administration and President Trump himself to try to reverse the results of the election. Uh, he, 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 he still talks about that he won the election, but the fact is he didn't. And the fact of the matter is, is that President Biden was inaugurated in, in the democracy work. I, I, I have the, I'm, yes, I'm, I'm, trou I think... I'm troubled by the straw man argument, right? That that America, you can't prove a negative, and you've laid out this concept that, well, you know, America is just heading into the abyss because of this. There's no way to prove otherwise. Isn't it's not alarmist? No, I, I there, there, there are a number of possible pathways forward. I, I think that most people would acknowledge that it was a much closer call. Uh, uh, in in January 6th and the events surrounding so subsequent to the election and up through January 6th then uh, then was recognized at the time uh, whether those institutions will withstand uh, yeah. the pressure from not, a second Trump administration is I think very much an open question I think it's something we need to yeah, examine I'm not, closely. I'm not, I'm not sure I really agree with you and I, I was there on January 6th outside the Capitol I'm not sure I would agree that it was a much closer call I don't think you know the, the idea that the that the military was going to somehow not transfer power or take over, it seems uh, ludicrous to me, at least from my reporting. But either way, um, America's system of government is quite different than, say, Canada's. Uh, now retiring Justice Breyer said this about the United States today. Take a listen. It's an experiment that's still going on. And I'll tell you something. You know who will see whether that experiment works? It's you, my friend. It's you, Mr. High School student. It's you, Mr. College student. It's you, Mr. Law School students. It's us, but it's you. It's that next generation and the one after that. My grandchildren and their children. They'll determine whether the experiment still works. And of course, I am an optimist, and I'm pretty sure it will. What a, what a great spirit. And I, I think about Canada that has benefited so much from the American experiment and the American democracy. And yet hearing from you that so many Canadians are worried, why not, why not give us all the benefit of the doubt? No, oh, we want to give you the benefit of the doubt. And we're, you know, I think we are, many of us are anguished by the developments in the United States. Uh, it's, it, it's, we are friends of America. You have to understand this, was, this article was written in the context of concern about, that, about a friend and about the, the dynamics, the political dynamics within the country. So, you know, uh, we, we need to start thinking about what the prospects would be for Canada. Should there be a second Trump administration? And should, and right. should that election be contested and, uh, and there be an attempt to erode the democratic institutions yeah, just, in the I, United States? Yeah, I, 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 for some reason, I have great confidence in the experiment and the framers. But I, I've got to sort of turn this on our head, on its head a little bit. Should we be worried about our northern neighbor? You've got Justin Trudeau. You know, called Fidel Castro a great humanitarian, demonizes those who won't get the vaccine, won't condemn China for genocide against the Uyghurs. Uh, should we be con concerned that you guys are turning into a socialist country? No, not at all. No, no we're, a, we're a capitalist democracy. We're somewhat left of, left of the United States in terms of our general social and, and cultural characteristics. But, uh, you know, no, we're not going to be a communist or a socialist country on the northern border of the United States. Well, that's, I, I, that's good to hear. I, I, you know, I think if you're talking about straw man, man, that's a straw man. You know, I, oh, well, I'm okay. not alone. I, 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 I'll, I'll, we'll leave it there. I think that, that's a good point. I'll give you, I'll give you that. Uh, doctor, unfortunately, we got to go, uh, but this is a great conversation, better than what we expected. Uh, we're going to have you back as you write more about uh, America, all right? All right, I'd be thank delighted. You. Yeah, thank you, Professor. All right, he gave them an ultimatum why fans of Neil Young won't hear his music on Spotify anymore. Spotify, which has a $100 million deal with Rogan, has now taken down Young's music. So capitalism collides with cancel culture and 
In this case, capitalism wins. Joining us now, Bacha Unger Sargon, deputy opinion editor of Newsweek, Vince Colonnais, host of the Vince Colonnais Show, editorial director of the Daily Caller. Good to see you both, uh, my friends. Uh, Vince, I got to tell you, I'm a, I'm a little surprised. I'm a little heartened. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. How rock and roll is that? Neil Young canceled himself. That's that's an amazing move. Um, yeah, this would be like if I launched like some sort of music career tonight and I had one song that made its way to Spotify and then I was like, you know what I'm going to do? It's either me or Neil Young. They'd be like, goodbye. Uh, because because in Spotify's case, like they've got so much money, $100 million wrapped up in Joe Rogan. It was very simply a business decision. Neil Young laid it all out, and he just it was just not a good move for him. He's, right, but we, we've, I, I, you know, I'm thinking about like Major League Baseball when they caved over the Atlanta over hosting the All Star Game in Atlanta. You don't always see the true business decision uh, happen. So, Bacha, we'll turn this around. If Rogan had demanded they take down Neil Young, you think there would have been a different <laughs> result? Of course. <laughs> you pick between Neil Young and Joe Rogan? I had, I mean, I'll, be, I'll be honest. I had to look up who Neil Young was, so I, I probably right, shouldn't. All right, all right. That, that, that's going too far. Neil Young has some great songs, but you know, Zed Jelani pointed out at his sub stack inquiremore.com um, that, you know, Neil Young had gone on a freedom of speech tour during the Bush era, you know, to against war and so forth, you know, and now he is on the side of so using whatever clout he has to threaten, you know, Spotify to silence somebody else's right to free speech, it really shows the pathway that liberals have taken. And But I think what's going on here is a little bit um, more complicated, and it's this. I think that liberal influencers, media characters, musicians, people who see themselves as leaders, you know, on the left, believe that they should have the right to tell people what to think. And they imagine that someone like Joe Rogan, who has, you know, 11 million downloads every night, is popular because he is telling his, his listeners what to think, and they are listening blindly when the truth is the opposite opposite. The reason Rogan is so popular is because he's mirroring the skepticism and the open-mindedness of his listeners. And so there's really this cultural collide happening as well. Yeah. Neil Young, Spotify fans, 2.4 million followers, 6 million monthly listeners. Obviously, Joe Rogan has way, way more than that. Spotify said, we want all the world's music and audio content to be available to Spotify users. With that comes great responsibility, balancing safety for listeners, freedom for creators, we have detailed policies. We have over 20,000 podcast episodes related to COVID since the start of the pandemic. We regret Neil's decision to remove his music from Spotify, but hope to welcome him back soon. You know, Vince, this brings up a, a larger point, and Bacha sort of alluded to it, but I, why don't we see any of these celebrities going after sort of the other much bigger social issues of our time? You don't see anybody say, look, I'm not going to do business with Apple until they stop exploiting the Uyghurs, or I'm not going to wear Nike until they stop exploiting the Uyghurs and selling in China. I, I think it's market power. I think that's one of the reasons why you see that. There's a lot of excuses made for such a big market like China. And that's why the, all that hypocrisy is always on display when it comes to the virtue signaling we see from American corporations. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think that that Spotify statement you just read is actually kind of revealing. I, I, if you walked away this week thinking that the news of this story is that it was a win for free speech, that Spotify was standing up for Joe Rogan, an open conversation, look no further than to the statement where they said they've taken down 20,000 podcasts discussing COVID. They are interested in protecting their market share, but they are, but they're simultaneously interested in that paternalism that we've seen, I think, overtake the American left, which is one and the same as so many American corporations, where they say there's only certain bounds to this conversation. The only way I'll look the other way is if there's enough market power to compel me to do it. And Bacha, I guess that's the $100 million man, right? That's their, Spotify has a $100 million contract with Joe Rogan. You can't afford to lose that. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. This is not about COVID. It's not about free speech. It's about capitalism, which is why they don't go after yeah. companies that benefit from slave labor by Uyghurs, because, you know, there's no market share to be lost. There's no consumer base mm -hmm. that cares about that in America, sadly. Yeah, very, very sad. Hey, appreciate you both sticking around. We had some breaking news, so we're going to have to run. Vince Bacha, good to see you both as always. Thanks for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.